I want to now introduce Kelly, who will run the next session. Um, and she will talk specifically about the PC Cloud platform. Uh, Kelly is an executive manager at Jet Education Services. She works across the value chain of research, strategy and planning, implementation and monitoring and evaluation to ensure high quality programs, policies and support to education. Her areas of specialization are technology for education and development, literacy acquisition and skills development. And her recent papers include interoperable data systems, a review to inform our South African initiative of uh, the PSET Cloud. So Kelly will demo the PSET Cloud platform and she's in conversation with the whole team. I'm going to let her uh, introduce her team to you, but I want to just add that there will be a poll in the session. So please do remember to submit your answers at the end of the session and quite, uh, kindly remember to make sure that you are in the correct session. Uh, people, delegates are struggling to get onto these polls because the session uh, has not been updated. So you can refer to make sure that you are uh, in the right session and you can click on, on the live now button so that you are part of the poll uh, later on when Kelly takes us through that. So over to you, Kelly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roxana. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and thank you to everyone who is joining us today to uh, see the Peace That Cloud platform. It's a very great privilege to be able to introduce this to you. It's a lot of work by a lot of different people, only some of which um, are, or of whom are joining us today for this panel session, but all of whom are greatly appreciated. Um, I'm joined today with some of our beneficiaries as well as, as developers. So I would like to introduce them to begin with, and then we will just launch into our discussion uh, and take you a little bit along the journey that we've, we've taken with the development of this platform. First, I would like to introduce Kahisa Tlobatla, he is a 25-year-old recent software development graduate from the universe, uh, Chwane University of Technology. Like a lot of us on this call, he's uh, very passionate about ICT, and his interest was born when he received, broke, and then fixed an old Windows 98 computer. So <laughs> I think that story will resonate with quite a few of us. Um, so he's one of the, the types of beneficiaries that we are hoping to help with this platform, a recent graduate who is navigating the learn and then earn spaces. I would also like to introduce Kurtida Bana. She's a training executive at Plastics SA and another excellent uh, example of some of the things that we have been talking about throughout this conference. Kurtida has been involved in the local South African plastics industry since 1989. She qualified with a national higher diploma in polymer technology and completed a postgraduate diploma in design thinking and innovation in 2019 through MIT Columbia University and the Tuck Institute. She's also completed two courses with the Witt School of Governance in Research Contextualization and Governance and Board Leadership also in 2019 and then in 2021 respectively. So you can see that she is a lifelong learner, just like all of us strive to be. Throughout her career, she's held a variety of roles but her current role uh, as training executive, she's held since 2011. She's also well-versed in the delivery of papers and conferences, and her favorite topic is innovation. So she joins us today to, uh, to speak about that. We are also joined by Keto Mtembo. He is a senior software engineer at Jumpco. He has a bachelor's in computer science from the National University of Science and Technology in Zimbabwe. And although he does not look like he is old enough to have this much experience, he has 19 years of experience in the ICT industry. <laughs> He's a digital transformation architect and a senior certified developer. He has extensive experience. He's worked in banking, insurance, government, and now with us on the PSET Cloud project in education. So we're very grateful to have him with us today to discuss some of the details of what he's done. I'm also joined by Andrew Akpan, a senior consultant at Rios Partners. He's an organizational development, strategic management, and facilitation specialist with a lot of experience in government and the development sectors. He's a philosophy major by trade. He's currently studying his PhD at the University of Johannesburg, focused on developing the philosophical groundwork for the building of just algorithms, which is another whole interesting topic, and I hope I get to hear him present on it someday. 
Um, he's helped us as a member of the Rios organizations with the scenario planning and some of our stakeholder engagement processes. So he joins us from that um, perspective. Finally, but not least at all, I would like to reintroduce to those who were with us yesterday, Barbara Dale Jones, the director of the Field Institute, uh, which is a consultancy and digital leadership training institution. Also a director of Thunder Bay Collective an implementation in, uh, agent for innovative and disruptive technologies and the Rocket School, which focuses on an extracurricular program to um, help children navigate tomorrow's world of work. She also serves on the advisory board and is an associate of Jet Education Services, and she leads the innovation team of the Peace at Cloud project. She also helped us with our user journeys and user uh, journey development. So that's the panel. It's probably one of the largest um, of our session uh, so far, and, and since we're the last session, I guess, overall. <laughs> but I would just like to start off um, hearing from some of our beneficiaries. So I would like to ask Kurtita, um, our first question. Kurtita, I would be very interested to hear, as an employer in the South African space, what are some of the challenges, just in your own words, that you face in procuring the talent that your organization needs? Um, thank you, Kelly. Um, it's a pleasure being here. So, um, you know, one of the biggest challenges we have in the plastic sector um, is a lack of undergraduate university programs in the engineering discipline, which focuses on plastics, materials, and processes, with learning in this field being limited to TUT and NMU, and only postgraduate specializations at the likes of University of Stellenbosch. So this mismatch between supply and demand is a struggle for the industry, who've obviously adapted by employing people from other engineering disciplines and familiarize them with plastics, this is not the ideal scenario, as the whole layer of people with plastics engineering skills is non-existent. This impacts the industry in a couple of ways, and one of it is one one of it is to severely have, um, you know, an engineering products in the industry. So people are, of course, doing this already, but I believe the more sophisticated approaches to developing products has been com compromised. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kartita. That was uh, an excellent summary. I would now like to go to Kahiso. From your perspective, as, as a uh, just recent graduate, now navigating the space of, of your first official job, how easy has that transition been? And what are the... uh, I'd like to first uh, thank everyone. Uh, thank you for including me in uh, the piece at Cloud. Uh, to answer your question, um, uh, being a newly graduate, uh, what you lack the most is opportunities and it's in the form of the information. Where do you pull your job opportunities, your postgraduate studies? I uh, uh, also like what um, one of our panelists, Kirtila, said, um, if you're doing engineering, especially with uh, my univer university, TUT, um, you don't have uh, a lot of opportunities outside TUT because you lack that information, you, you, it's not centralized and one has to jump from site to site to site, which has a plethora of problems like uh, the accreditation of the site, uh, is it a scam site? So you have a lot of newly graduates chasing their own tails, uh, trying to find some form of opportunity and um, there's a lot of scams in between. So uh, the piece at Cloud, how it helps it, it's somewhat centralizes everything, the opportunities, and it makes it much easier uh, to navigate. I'm not sure if I answered both questions. It sounds like a two-part question. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you very much, Kahisa. I think that was perfect. So now you've heard it from the mouths of our beneficiaries. What are the problems they're facing? Mismatch in, in skills supply and skills demand. Many of the things and the themes that we've heard emerge over the, the course of this two-day conference, um, but just maybe from the perspective of people who are living the reality. Um, so I would now like to go to uh, Keto. And Keto, please take us through a little bit, you know, taking these user journeys into account and the problems that, that we researched, what was your step, first step in the development and how did you then engage the development process? Thank you, uh, Kelly. Uh, I, the, the good thing with the, our engagement was we started by first considering what the user needs were. So we took a user-centric approach as much as it's important to build 
the uh, product right, it's more important to build the right product. So we focused basically on the uh, on the job seekers looking for for employment opportunities, on our learners looking for educational opportunities, and then bringing them together with the employers and the educational institutes. So this becomes the foundation, understanding what's involved there. Once we've got an understanding of what's involved there, basically it's just working from that and understanding determining the scope. There's a lot of things that you can do, but what can we do right now that is most urgent? Coming up with an architecture, how do we put these things together and then having a design and going into the implementation. Thank you so much, Keto. I think uh, that really clarifies the importance of what we call user-centered design, which has been one of the key principles that we have engaged throughout the, uh, the development of this platform and, and really all of the steps of the Peace at Cloud kind of feed into that. I would now like to actually introduce the platform to you. We have a short video, um, not that short actually, it's about seven minutes, but I hope it's entertaining. So I will hand over to Darren, who is our technical support to, to show you that video. Thank you. The PSET Cloud is designed to deliver the insights that will help individuals as well as institutions make informed decisions about education, training, and the world of work. Using advanced technologies, the PSET Cloud facilitates better understanding of and access to opportunities for citizens through the improved use of data. Before we dive into the crux of the user experience, we need to understand who our users are. Users of the PSET Cloud wear many hats, citizen, student, employer, educator. There is a symbiotic relationship between these user types. Certain features of the platform can be used by all individuals and organizations, such as registration. These engagements generate data which enriches the experience for other users. Let's look at one PSET Cloud user's journey. Meet Zanele. Zanele is 18 years old and lives in a rural township in the Eastern Cape. She has just graduated from high school and is unemployed and unsure what to do next. She possesses an entry-level smartphone but has limited access to data. However, Zanele has access to her local library where she can use the internet for a limited time. Zanele is now a NEET, not in education, employment or training mainly because she has had limited exposure to the working world and does not know what opportunities lie ahead of her with the qualification that she has so far achieved. Furthermore, Zanele is not sure what jobs are in demand and what the requirements are for such job opportunities. Zanele wonders if only there was a central location where I could see what is available for me. Zanele visits her local library and browses the net where she searches for opportunities. Zanele navigates to the PSET Cloud where she is able to explore current trends in skills demand and work opportunities. She sees that her maths and ICT skills are high in demand, but that she will have to study further for the positions she's interested in. Zanele decides to join the PSET Cloud on joining, she is able to capture her matric certificate, which is automatically verified against government records. Employers and educational institutions can now verify her credentials in a trusted, seamless process through the PSET Cloud. Zanele also registers for notifications of opportunities that match her skill set. And now, the PSET Cloud has a job to do. The PSET Cloud works through three key principles. The first is interoperability, or the ability to exchange and meaningfully interpret information across systems in order to produce useful results. In other words, the PSET Cloud brings like-minded systems together to provide the insights and information individuals, institutions and government need to successfully navigate the worlds of education, skilling and work. The second principle is self-sovereign identity. 
Self-Sovereign Identity or SSI leverages blockchain technology, digital wallets and data mandates to give individuals control of their data, allowing them to grant third parties explicit access to a specific well-defined set of their own data. With SSI, trust between the issuer of a credential and the verifier of a credential is established through automated processes based on an immutable transaction using blockchain, improving efficiencies, reducing or eliminating fraud, and ultimately emphasizing the individual as the owner of their data. Finally, the PSET Cloud aims to achieve credential fluency. Every person is on a lifelong learning journey. But not all learning takes place in schools. Credential fluency is the idea that informal and non-formal learning, for example skills learned at home, at work, through short courses and so on, can be seamlessly integrated into the formal learning gained in schools, TVETs and universities. Credential fluency can be realized through the user-centric approach, transition to digital qualifications and credentials, improved data interoperability, and closer alignment between learning and the world of work enabled by the PSET cloud. Let's see what this means for Zanele. Once Zanele's information is received, the PSET cloud goes to work applying its key principles of SSI, interoperability and credential fluency to the complex use of data. The value add of the PSET Cloud comes from integrating multiple data sets together to generate insights spanning multiple stakeholders in real time. The PSET Cloud offers other opportunities for improved matching and efficiencies. For example, the previous employment information a candidate supplies can be verified by the relevant employers, qualification information can be verified, trends in employment and training can be pulled in real time, and so much more. In Zanele's case, machine learning is leveraged to match her relevant opportunities based on her past experiences and credentials. The foundation of machine learning is data and the larger cross-cutting data sets of the PSET cloud mean the machine learning models created are closer to real-world expectations. Interoperability between data sets and institutions also gives rise to new technologies and processes. As stakeholders integrate functionally, collaboration is fostered that allows for new ideas to take root. At its heart, the PSET Cloud is about synchronizing not only data, but also a way of work. For example, in the case of self-sovereign identity, this means the ways in which individuals are identified and how their information is shared. Self-sovereign identity is only one way the PSET Cloud protects users and their privacy. In addition to cybersecurity measures, the PSET Cloud is also designed in compliance with privacy legislation like POPIA and through methods such as aggregation and potentially even differential privacy, the PSET Cloud can display trends without exposing the unique data of individuals. Now that we've seen how the PSET Cloud does its work, let's check back in with Zanele. Through its complex processing, the PSET Cloud has found a match for Zanele. Zanella receives a notification on her smart device through SMS and email that there is an opportunity match. Unfortunately, she does not have enough data to regularly use the internet. In its fully realized vision, the PSET Cloud is zero rated, so Zanella can still log on to her profile from her mobile device and use the features of the PSET Cloud. Zanella logs on to her profile and views her matches online she finds a learnership opportunity that appeals to her and engages with an employer through the PSET Cloud. The PSET Cloud offers many benefits to a recent graduate such as Zanele, but the PSET Cloud is not just for youth. It is for everyone seeking to improve their skills or to advance their career. The PSET Cloud also offers opportunities for education and training institutions which can view and use real-time skills trends to more rapidly review and adjust their education and skilling programs to more accurately meet labor market demand. 
For employers, the PSET Cloud offers recruitment through advanced technologies to find individuals that match the skills they require. And the principles of self-sovereign identity and alignment between data sets allows employers to, with permission, verify the stated credentials of applicants electronically through a trusted process. For South Africa, the PSET Cloud offers opportunities to collaborate, improve the utilization of data for decision-making and learning, and ultimately contribute to a reality in which all people are connected as part of a lifelong journey of learning and work opportunities. Thank you very much, uh, Darren, for showing us the video. I hope you all enjoyed it. And we have a small poll, as Roxana mentioned at the beginning um, of this session. We are just asking a few questions in response to the video. And if you would be so kind as to fill out the poll, we would really appreciate it. It will stay open for the next 10 or 15 minutes. So please take this opportunity um, to do that. So moving back to some of our, our panel participants now, um, I would like to ask Andrew his initial response and reaction to the piece that Cloud and what we've developed and are in the process of refining at this moment. Um, what's your initial response and how do you feel that this responds to the stakeholders that you have interacted with through the course of your involvement in this project? Thank you, uh, Kelly. Uh, and I'm very, I'm very happy to be here. And thank you to Chet and Mesita for organizing a brilliant uh, conference. I'm wearing multiple hats in this conversation. So I'll be speaking from various places. And I think with those hats comes, uh, come with it multiple commitments. And I know, I think probably I wanna quickly, you know, uh, list those commitments so that when I speak, you know, you know where I'm speaking from. I think the first commitment I have is to, to, to myself as an African. You know, I reside in South Africa, and I think that is quite intuitive, and people should know that what, what happens here concerns me. And my second, second commitment is to, to, again, to myself as an intellectual being, you know, I'm doing my PhD in philosophy, and I've spent a lot of time thinking about, thinking about these things. Uh, you know, what does it mean to be a knower in the age of the internet? And I also have commitments to my, to my employer. We as partners, as you mentioned, Kelly, I'm a consultant there. I think I want to begin by, you know, I think my initial impressions would be somewhat a, a broader observation, a broader, you know, uh, point uh, that we should consider uh, going forward, perhaps a philosophical point. And there is no doubt that, you know, I'm very excited about what this, the potentials of this, of this platform, uh, of its ability to, you know, work with other initiatives or other efforts to, to addressing unemployment in, in, in our country. Uh, and there, you know, I think it's almost unquestionable that this will benefit a lot of people. Uh, but the question that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm wrestling with is why have we spent a lot of time, you know, developing this? Uh, what, is, what, 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 what is the philosophical inspiration behind it? Uh, or what is the philosophical motive? Vision. Um, given you know the resources and the time that we have we have put into this. And I think in making this observation, I'm leaning into, into my background in philosophy. So you know, if, if I sound a bit <laughs> a bit philosophical, permit me, but the 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 question or the answer to my question is you know, I think it's found in in the conception of the meaning of life. Uh, that we hold, the meaning of what you know a good life is, and for me, you know, a good life is one, or at least you know, as a pertains to piece of cloud, is one where people have meaningful work, you know, or where we have the right skills that matches the right job, and the right skills, you know, I think I define it as you know, uh, having having any job that can you know uh, get you some income, you know, or. Uh, uh, Make you live a meaningful, dignified life. And the um, excitement that I have about this project is its, it's, 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 it's ability to map trends and show us what to study. And I think this could have unintended consequences. And the consequences could be um, 
that you know education becomes very instrumental. Education and learning becomes something very instrumental. Education is for the sake of job. Uh, and you know, uh, if you are if you're educated, you know, it, it must land you the job. But I want I want to posit that you know there are other non-instrumental goods that we should pay attention to. And I think you know the danger that I see with the trends is that you know certain things like uh, poetry or philosophy or the humanities generally might be might suffer and people might think that oh you know I don't need to study these things. But you know, I would argue that these other things are needed to live a meaningful life. And I think one of the other things that excites me is the idea of credential fluency. And you know, I think my, my invitation is let's keep taking a systemic, a, a systemic look at, at this intervention uh, rather than, you know, and, and be very careful of what we prize and what we value uh, as, as, as what counts as, as a meaningful life. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. I think those are some very astute observations. In fact, in this panel, you are talking to two people with an English literature degree um, who have now gone into the technology space and leveraged that in various ways. So we were actually just having that conversation uh, earlier this morning that people underestimate us, you know, <laughs> um, and the importance of being able to write and structure your thoughts and have that kind of literary background. So I think it's a very valid point that if we're focused on concrete skills and the types of competencies that are put into job descriptions, what are we leaving out? Like, what are we less focused on? So I think that's a very important point that we need to consider um, going forward. I would like to go quickly to, um, to an audience question. We have a question from Bajith. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name, um, but he was asking uh, how this will succeed in harmonizing and synchronizing data from all the types of disparate systems in South Africa. And I think we also heard in the previous panel um, some concerns around this and the difficulties that, that can crop up um, if you have very bespoke systems. So I would like to go to Keto to perhaps answer that question on to how this technology works and how the interoperability aspect of it actually technically works. Uh, thanks, Kelly. Um, there are multiple stakeholders in this uh, environment. So we've got, so we talk about qualifications, accreditations, educational institutions, employers, running on multiple different systems. Technically speaking, this is a problem that has been faced in a lot of places. And if you go into the enterprise space, they talk about uh, uh, enterprise integration platforms. So we are able to integrate many different systems together. The, so there is a system which is responsible for allowing these different systems to talk to each other. In a way, you can think of it as an interpreter for systems. This is what the PCIF cloud is. So technically, it sits in the middle. If one system stores information in one different format, one pass it to another in a different format, it can do the translation and pass it across. Of course, it does much, much more than that. So it is very much possible. And this is one of the premises of the PCIF cloud. We can go into the stakeholder systems to get information or they can pass it on to us. But the basic idea, let's leave all these data sets to get the maximum amount of value out of them. Thank you, Keto. Um, a related question has come through actually. What is the basis on which the PSET Cloud would match Zanelle's uh, credentials to opportunities? And I would like to ask Barbara Dale Jones to perhaps answer that question for us. Mm, thanks very much, Kelly. Um, and, and this brings us to the issue of self-sovereign identity. And perhaps I can just take a step back and talk to self-sovereign identity as one of the key innovations of this project. As you said, um, there, there are three key innovations, the idea of the sovereignty of individual data, credential fluency and interoperability, and they're all connected. And by the way, I would say that a fourth innovation is the process that we've gone through to unearth um, user needs and the kind of uh, user journeys and solutioning process we've gone through, but we can talk more about that later. Um, so those who were part of the SSI discussion yesterday will have heard some of this uh, before, so forgive me for repeating it, but um, the key principle of self-sovereign identity is that it flips the data ownership model away from the individual. Uh, at least away from the um, centralized authority to the individual. So it decentralizes uh, data ownership 
and it essentially allows an individual to own and have agency over their own data. Now, this addresses a number of issues. It addresses issues like fraud, for example, very substantially addresses issues like fraud. Um, it addresses the privacy issue that is so um, current and important for us. It attends to many administrative pain points, but um, one of the key things it allows for is a very clear handshake between what the labor market requires and what the education system is providing. So by having decentralized data points um, that are, are stored on the blockchain and gathered in real time, um, with data about individuals' learning credentials, be they formal, informal, or non-formal, um, what you're able to have is an education and training system that has very uh, responsive um, real-time data that it's able to broadcast at the labor market and vice versa. So without going into the technicalities of how this is constructed, essentially, the uh, technology used is self-sovereign identity. It's reliant on the blockchain. It's reliant on the decentralized nodes of data of the blockchain. It relies on the real-time exchange of data and it answers a key um, uh, requirement of all of the users that we spoke to. And, and you know, just to say that uh, we did a lot of interviewing of not just employers and individual um, citizens, but also of the education and training providers and TVET colleges and industry bodies and so on in the country to understand pain points. And they've obviously all got their individual pain points, but a very common issue for all of them is the need for a responsive, real-time, intelligent data ecosystem. And that's what self-sovereign identity um, eventually facilitates. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, so I think we're back to a little bit of, of the challenges raised by particularly Kirtita at the very beginning of this session, which would be, um, you know, if we've got self-sovereign identity and if we achieve this idea of credential fluency and we're able to integrate different types of learning from across multiple platforms seamlessly into the system with the permission of the user through self-sovereign identity, well, what does that mean for our ability to predict uh, not only employment opportunities, but also the education and training needs of people going through the system. So I would just like to go back to Kurtida quickly for some reflections on, um, on what we've proposed and what the PSED Cloud Platform is, is doing. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. So, you know, I, I think it's a super start to something that um, should not lose focus and energy. Um, and if all those who are involved remain as passionate going forward, then this platform could end up being one of South Africa's innovation contributions to developing economies. Um, and, you know, it's really what the gurus call reverse innovation then, and it would be amazing if we can, when actually take this run with it, develop it to that point, um, uh, and it would be something very progressive to do. For me, the concerns are around the fit between the candidate and a career path and or the candidate and the workplace, which needs to be developed to the point of absolute best fit. So where every stage is verifiable. Um, and this is where the tweaks and development areas will need to be focused. I think once the access and accuracy of data challenges are ironed out. So for example, um, you know, if the student does not fit the job currently, what can be done to achieve that fit over a period of time? And then what are those mechanisms that need to be built into the system from an evaluation perspective for best fit to achieving badges or micro-credentials um, in order to, pro to, to um, progress towards best fit for that particular job? And then that progression needs to contain learning op options with non-formal and formal channels or various other channels that are available. And I think, um, you know, that's, that's how I see that progressing in the future. Um, but for now, I mean, it's, it's an excellent start and um, definitely something that the country desperately requires. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, thank you, Kartita. Yes, and as everyone has, has said today, um, you know, we can't do it alone. So, 
the idea that Carmen proposed uh, or is, is pursuing actually quite aggressively uh, that she spoke about in the previous session, the idea of, of the pathway network, you know, so bringing different stakeholders together with different offerings so that people can be kind of guided um, through a logical progression and pathway towards their goals. I think that's where we're all trying to get, but you're right. Uh, there's still a ways to go, <laughs> but we are very excited to be here and, and to have taken the first step there. Um, I would like to also ask Kahiso for his thoughts on the platform. He's one of our beta testers, so he's gone in and he's seen everything we've done to date, so he can give you the real story. <laughs> Sorry, you're still on mute. Oh, yes, uh, can you hear me now? Cool. Um, yes, uh, so about the platform, um, I love the color scheme. The colors are amazing. Um, it's built on already existing design principles. Uh, I like the limited aspect of it's, lim it's limiting the amount of uh, customization you can do, especially with the list and the uh, drop and the first uh, landing page. I like the fact that you can oscillate through a list or you can use cards or, you know, the, the fact that you can have a, a level of um, customization that is amazing for, for the platform. Also, the choice of icons are very intuitive. It's built on icons we're already familiar with um, and the placement of everything. Uh, oh, and also how it um, translates to the mobile from your desktop to a mobile. It collapses very nicely. Uh, it also responds well to whatever the device you're using. Um, it's actually shocking that it's a it's a demo, a, a beta, because uh, it, it looks it looks looks really nice. It looks really nice. Um, also, how the data is represented under the insights, um, the pie chart, beautiful, perfect, and uh, the detailing around. Uh, so it's very easy to use, and the fact that you don't necessarily need to have a a, a, you need to sign in and have a profile. Uh, you can also be a casual user, uh, which uh, is very beneficial because a lot of people don't like signing in and out. So it also gives you that flexibility. I don't necessarily need to uh, provide any of my details to see. And once you do provide your details, then you can access the dashboard and everything else. Then uh, the picture just becomes a lot brighter and a lot better. Um, so yeah, that's um, a brief summary. I could go on and on because I'm very happy with the uh, with the platform. But let me so much just leave it here. Thank you so much, Kahi. So um, I know the audience can't see this, but Keto is grinning from ear to ear through your entire uh, session there, your response. So he's very happy to hear that. Um, Keto, I would actually like to speak a little bit now about the details, the back end what the AI actually does, um, how it works. So if now that we've seen the concept play out, we've talked a little bit about our responses. Can you just elaborate on the innovations that you have built into this um, very user-friendly platform that Kahiso described? Thank you, Kelly. Um, the interesting thing, I think, for me is if, if you wanted to match uh, um, individuals to opportunities, it's very easy to do that based on a description. So if I've got some text, I'm looking for someone in computer science and it's got computer science in the text that match them. But you might find that there are actually individuals outside of the computer science space classically who can actually fit in as well. And certain organizations start to realize that and start employing, for example, the electronics engineers as into that role. So even though the text does not have the word electronics engineers, those engineers are going in there. The classical way of matching would not pick that up. But your machine learning will start to pick up that the people taking up these opportunities actually have got electronic engineering. And all of a sudden, that individual with electronic engineering can get offered that position. So there's some insight that comes, comes in beyond just the structural approach that we take. It's, a, it's an insight that comes from the experience of what's happening on the ground. Different organizations can then leverage the experience of other organizations through the machine learning algorithms that have picked up this insight. Similarly, individuals are at an advantage because perhaps I'm an electronics engineer and all of a sudden I see this job coming up. It doesn't have electronics engineer, but it opens up my mind to say, you know what, I could actually move into this space. Some people have done it. How have they done it? So this is one of the innovations that's come into the PSET Cloud, going beyond just your structural, what just looking at the text, but leveraging the experience that's out there in industry through machine learning. 
Thank you. Thank you, Keto. Could you speak a little bit about um, also trends matching? So we heard earlier, Eduarda um, and her panel spoke to us quite a bit about different ways that trends are being matched and found and uh, skills or needs are being identified across different sectors. Can you explain a little bit about how the piece at Cloud um, will do that sort of work to display the types of trends that could advise things like education and training institutions and their programs, um, even probably employers to look for what type of cutting edge skills they might need to recruit. And of course, for citizens to better understand what kind of skills they need to gain for their goals. Thanks. Thank you, Kelly. So when we talk about trends and analysis, the very most important thing there is the data. Uh, and the challenge we face currently is that this data sits in many different places. So for someone in real time to get an understanding, for example, on the supply side, and link that to the demand side. Those are two different sectors, some would say. Someone would say one is education, the other is labor. So the PISA Cloud aims to bring those two sectors together in such a way that those two data sets become merged, uh, logically speaking. And you can imagine if that is the case, as a student, I can right now ask what is the major um, qualification linked to opportunities that are being taken up that's in demand. You can already see it right now. So the actual uh, functional side is something that I think we have nailed down in statistics. But the challenge is bringing those data sets together and bring them together in such a way that we bring the information before the stakeholder and the decision maker in real time. Thank you, Keta. So still a lot of challenges um, and a lot of considerations, particularly in the South African context, because the expertise to kind of deliver on this sort of system, as I understand it, needs to be spread across different levels of governance, different levels of entry, different levels of individuals. Um, and one of the other challenges that we are still working on and thinking about is this challenge which was raised earlier today around the informal sector. How do we reach the informal sector? How do we incorporate kind of informal opportunities and through credential fluency, uh, we do have the potential for some sort of integration between informal, non-formal, and formal learning and different types of skills development and skills acquisition. But in terms of reaching those individuals who may not have access to a smartphone or reaching those, uh, those employment opportunities, which may not be posted um, on kind of digital platforms, this is still an ongoing challenge and one that I imagine is, is um, common to development situations and, and countries in similar situations to South Africa. So not all the answers yet. This conference is just a starting point, um, but we're very excited to be here. So with that, I would like to actually go to Andrew again, because the Peace at Cloud is as much about organizations, relationships, changing the ways of work as it is about the actual technology. Um, and I just want to ask him, what is the role of scenario building in that process? And what do you think it has achieved um, through this kind of innovative process that Barbara was talking about. Thank you, Kelly, for that question. That is a brilliant question. I, I think we have heard throughout this conference of the difficulties uh, that this sort of this sort of platform, you know, could breed. You know, people not willing to share their data, and I was also privileged to look at the MVP. As it stands now, you know, we don't have a lot of data, so we need a lot of uptake. Uh, and the scenario process was, you know, essentially about building relationship. And Rio's partners, you know, we have been supporting Jet and Mesita uh, in the stakeholder engagements necessary to build to build a piece of cloud. You know, we we, we convened a cross sector of stakeholders to come together and develop a set of, set of scenarios on what the future of piece of cloud could be. And I think that publication is on the Jet website. And I will not describe the scenarios. But you know, to your question, Kelly, you know, of you know the, the, the usefulness of the scenario uh, scenarios in this process. So I think you know, essentially scenarios were used to enable this coalition to move forward together on their shared challenge. You know, I think another way of saying move forward together is, is, is the word colla uh, uh, collaboration. And you know, typically as we do in, in many systems that we, we that we support, we 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 systems where people might not like each other you know but there's a problem and they might not trust each other and we we find that you know in situations of, uh, of that of that nature where you know the stakes are high and there's little trust one of the ways to enable movement is for people to work together and create three or four stories of what the future could be uh, uh, 
what the future could look like. And these stories is essentially what we call uh, scenarios, which is basically stories of, of what could happen in the future. And these stories has to be constructed in a way that is relevant. You know, it addresses current circumstances and concerns and is challenging, you know, makes the visible visible. And the stories must be plausible, evidence-based and, and believable. And they are not predictions or preferences or options. Sure. You know, in the PSET cloud, these were stakeholders in the PSET system, you know, private colleges, skills development, providers, public and private higher institutions, you know, TVET colleges. Um, and these people, you know, have different ideas of what the problem is in the sector. Uh, and they have different solutions of what, or, or, or ideas of what is needed as solutions. And in the scenario process, we tell people to suspend, to suspend the idea of what they think is needed and to simply come up with drivers and use those drivers to tell a set of stories of what might happen in the future. Future. And by working together, people begin to discover that their point of view alone might not, you know, will not tell a complete story. And they need to listen to people. And they, you know, in this process, they begin to build trust, they begin to collaborate. And in ICSIS, you know, the stakeholders from these, you know, uh, stakeholder groups develop four scenarios, uh, you know, and they call it, we, uh, call it by very interesting names. So essentially what the scenario exercise did was to enable stakeholders to see that there are options and choices uh, to be made. You know, if you are thinking about the future of PC Cloud, you know, there are various options, you know, or various futures that could emerge through our action or inaction. And perhaps, you know, we can work together to bring about a desired future if we do things differently. So it was about building that joint vision, but also, you know, going beyond building a joint vision to say, okay, given, you know, set of scenarios or uh, 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 elements of these scenarios that we find we think it's, it's desirable how can we bring this to life how can we work you know uh, to bring this to life and you know people then you know discover that one of the ways is to share data and to build this platform together so i would say the scenario exercise enable you know shared accountability you know for advancing you know the principles that underpin this work and it allowed you know um, this innovation to be to be to be guided by people's experiences and insight and knowledge and allowing the multiple points of points of view. And I think we're also able to create a sense of joint ownership. You know, there are early people who have already made commitments that they'll be part of this platform. They are willing to share their data, you know, in a way that is, of course, uh, aligned with reg uh, regulatory concerns, you know, to build a platform that is uh, that is viable and useful. You know, and people, you know, by working together, began to address the dilemmas uh, facing te technological innovation, you know, questions of data privacy and how do we get around it, you know, and I, I think essentially, you know, the scenario exercise allowed people to foster collaboration, you know, in the development and the rollout of this initiative. So it was, it was not the end, it was a means to, to, to an end, a means to enable this collaboration, a means for people to see the vision, a means for people to, uh, to collaborate. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, I really appreciate that thoughtful response to the question. And I do believe, as Barbara said earlier, that uh, the fourth innovation of the Peace at Cloud platform is actually the process surrounding it. And uh, that's not limited, of course, to the group that we have here today. Pretty much everything that has happened throughout the conference, from the governance model uh, discussion to the self-sovereign identities discussion, data privacy, all of these different innovations that have been introduced the work that other organizations are doing within South Africa in similar spaces, all of this has fed in um, to what we've been able to achieve. So really we do stand on the shoulders of, of giants, <laughs> you know. Um, I would just like to ask one more process question, but before I do, I would like to ask the audience as well, this is your opportunity to please um, give us any questions that you may have. Anything you would like us to address in the last 10 minutes of our session? I've got plenty of questions of my own, but if you have things you would like us specifically to talk to, um, we're very happy to do that. I would like to ask Barbara a question about process. So Barbara was also very instrumental in this type of innovative process and, and what we've gone through to get to the point of defining the platform and then, and then um, letting Keto and his team build it. Barbara, could you tell us a little bit about the process of user journeys and what that contributed? 
Thanks very much, Kelly. Yes, we adopted a, as um, Keto said earlier, a user-centric approach uh, to the journey that we've taken. And that meant that we um, used design thinking as the key methodology. And design thinking starts fundamentally from the user outcome backwards. Um, and so we started with the process of, of empathy mapping, where, as I mentioned earlier, we went into a very deep discovery phase, trying to understand what the pain points of users are, what their issues are, what their hopes are, their thoughts, their feelings, their touch points with the education training system, um, and as they transition from learning to earning. Um, and, and as I said, uh, our, our main um, groupings of investigation with the individual citizen, the employers who are looking for skilled graduates, and um, education and training providers, TBET colleges, industry bodies, and so on. Um, so having gone through a whole um, process of um, empathy mapping and identification of opportunities and looking for common themes in terms of the unmet needs of these users and the uh, outcomes that they require, we then went into an ideation process um, and that led us to the kind of innovative answers that we've identified like self-sovereign identity, uh, credential fluency, um, and, and interoperability and so on. So the important thing to say is that we're not working from technologies um, off, off the base of, of technologies that have been created and saying, well, those are the technologies that we want and therefore we're crafting a solution around that. We're working off the basis of there are multiple pain points for the various users who are engaging with the education training system and the credentialing system and looking for um, either jobs themselves or looking for people to employ. And what are those and how do we understand them and how do we address those unmet needs and those, those user outcomes? Um, so we're in the process really now of prototyping, and I really want to emphasize that what we've built here in the video that you've seen today about the, the PZ Cloud, this is not a final platform that we've built. This is an MVP. This is a minimum viable product. We're very intentionally and deliberately putting something out into the sector now to say, have a look at it and give us your feedback. And based on your feedback, we're going to adjust, we're going to iterate, we're going to pivot and we're going to keep developing and keep learning, keep iterating. Um, and it's obviously a very fast moving and interesting space that we're working in, not just in South Africa, but internationally. We've heard speakers talking about a very different educational world over the last two years. Somebody like Beth Havinga yesterday talking about how Ed3 uh, builds off Web3. Um, so, you know, suddenly we've got not just the idea of decentralized data, but we've got the idea of decentralized learning. And um, Katita spoke about, you know, learning tokens. Um, there's the idea that's gaining much currency in the crypto world, for example, of play to earn. You know, how are we, as the education and training system, going to adapt with the, the quick disruptions that are occurring in the world around us and thus in the education and training sector? Um, so that's our challenge with um, the PSET Cloud, it's, uh, and, and we're staying true to the principles of design thinking where we're keeping our eyes firmly cast on the users and on what their unmet needs are, and we're really trying to attend to those with what we solution and what we prototype. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think that the people we have the most to learn from are definitely the, the people that we're hoping to benefit. Um, those employers and those individuals who are moving through the system, whether they're job seekers currently employed, looking to upskill, um, or just to stay relevant in their field. So I would, in the absence of audience questions, I would like to give the, um, the last words to our beneficiaries, to Kurtida and to Kahiso. So I would like to start with Kahiso. Um, can you just give us some final thoughts on what you think we should be watching out for, what lessons we should learn from your experience, and what we should really think about going forward? Sorry, you're still on mute. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. Um, and, uh, as I was trying to say, um, uh, regarding the platform itself, um, 
uh, since it's already in development phase and we already developed it's already being developed up um, i like where it is now and based on all the discussions i love where it's going uh, it seems like the sky is definitely not the limit when this footprint's on the moon for uh, this project um, uh, that's pretty much what i wanted to just get across uh, that oh uh thing to worry about uh, with the young people what tends to fly over our head is how the message is formed and how it's presented to us uh, especially now with the more popcorn generation where everything needs to be shorter than a TikTok video. Uh, so that will just be something we we'll have to navigate around just the messaging of how it will land to my peers uh, because, you know, we tend to like small bite-sized things. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you all again. Thank you very, very much for the opportunity. Thank you so much for, for joining us and for your thoughts. I'm the live journal generation, so I have resisted and fought this switch down to like, you know, <laughs> shorter and shorter TikTok videos and stuff. Um, but it's it's really important for us to keep in mind. Uh, Kurtida, from your side. So my last thoughts are, you know, around um, the disconnect that we have currently between key government institutions and industry in working towards a growth agenda um, to create employment opportunities and jobs in South Africa. And it's this disconnect and lack of alignment that does not help in resources being directed in a focused way to achieve meaningful milestones for both government and industry. And I think if we don't start creating those opportunities um, you know, the best systems in the world are actually going to become white elephants because it's those opportunities that people need to actually tap into. And, and this particular group of people that we're, um, that's our target audience for this kind of product, for example, young people, um, you know, they need these opportunities. So, yeah, we need to create them. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate those thoughts. And I think we've all learned a lot from this conference and, and from you guys, and we will continue to learn from our beta testers. Um, we have one last question. Where can we interact with the demo MVP? Um, in about a week, we hope we will be able to open it to a wider audience. At the moment, we're still finalizing some things with our beta testers. We have one more round of development, uh, one more week of development. So. I'm not going to put Keto on the spot and make him tell you what the platform is at this moment, but we will definitely be emailing it to everyone um, and sharing the video widely as well. There was another question around that. I would like to thank our panelists for joining us today, for the audience, for being part of this um, session. We encourage comments, questions, and feedback and further engagement on the, on the PSAC Cloud platform. Thank you all very much.